Morning, church. Morning. Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 9. Uh, and I missed you guys last week. Uh, I did. And uh, let me tell you why. Uh, if that's how the rest of the world spends Sundays, I'll pass. That was boring. Uh, Eric and I were talking. It was like having Thanksgiving dinner alone. I, I missed the energy. I missed the encouragement. I missed the music. I, I miss all of it. And so uh, uh, it's good to see you. And I'm glad we all survived the one week of winter we had. And it was... It was effective, and it killed all of our programming, but it's good to see you. Uh, glad you are here. If you're visiting, my name is Mark, and I'm one of the ministers here, and I get the privilege of uh, speaking this morning and sharing with you what I've learned, and I want to tell you the series we're in, but before we do that, um, I know Clifford and Pam don't necessarily want me to do that, but since he's not an elder anymore, what can he do to me? Uh, so here we go. Uh, I want to tell you the, the, one of the reasons that my wife and I decided to move our family from Michigan to come to Missouri uh, to have the privilege of being a part of this team was because of the elders of this church. Uh, because the eight or nine men at that time that shared with me their vision for what they wanted to do, uh, for their ability to have a good balance of oversight and yet freedom, uh, for their belief and for the privilege that they gave my family to come be a part of this, uh, I'm going to be forever indebted. Uh, Clifford and Pam have had over 40 years of experience, as Clifford shared in the video. You know, Pam has been here her whole life, and she's only 42, so, you know, they met young. But he served 24 years as an elder. Now, my Bible tells me that there's going to be a crown for those who serve in that capacity, a crown that I won't wear and many of us won't wear, but it's earned by the weight that these men carry in praying for, disciplining, overseeing, and just taking care of God's people in this community. And so I hope if you know Clifford or Pam that you'll take an opportunity to personally address them. Uh, I know it's been really hard. Pam's been tearful all day because this is her home, her family. Uh, but I keep reminding her, she's, she's not leaving family. She's just going down to, to be a part of that church that we started with her grandkids and her uh, son-in-law and daughter and invest in that community. And that's what we're here for, is to send people out to do good things. And so you'll see them around here. What they've done is they've uh, stepped away from their leadership role here, but they haven't stepped away from family. Uh, so I know that would encourage them, if you know them, to uh, give them a good word. Uh, pray for them, and we're excited about what's going to happen down there. Our series is called Relentless Pursuit. It's through the Gospel of Mark. It deals with Mark's rush, this relentless pursuit of Jesus to come, reveal himself, and then show us who he is by the cross. And we're at the ninth chapter today, so we've made the turn in the story. But let me tell you, for those of you that have been in and out, or maybe you're just visiting this first week, here's what we've learned in the first eight chapters. We learned that Jesus' commission came from God. He was sent by God to represent God here on earth, and he came as God. His authority to overcome evil comes from the word of God, and the power to withstand temptation and sin was his authority. His plan was to raise up a kingdom of followers who would love him and serve him and preach the good news of this kingdom to anyone who would listen. Uh, his right to forgive sins comes from the fact that he, as God, was the one sinned against. His power is over all things. It's been demonstrated over death, over illness, over storms, over evil. It's all been present. Jesus has all the power that we need him to have to do what we need him to do. His identity was revealed by the mouth of God on two occasions. His name reveals who he is, Yeshua, Savior. Should be no question by his Hebrew name what he came to do. And his glory was revealed two weeks ago in our sermon about the Mount of Transfiguration when God said these words, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Do you remember the rest of it? Listen to him. His identity, his calling, all has been revealed. We get to chapter nine and Mark makes a turn in the story. It's a dramatic turn. It goes from who he is to what he came to do. Even when the disciples didn't understand it or didn't appreciate it, Jesus was on a relentless pursuit to go to the cross to fulfill his name as Savior. The disciples had been with him for two years and they'd seen him do amazing things, but they knew the time was approaching when he was going to leave. And so there's a concern. How would they do when he wasn't there? And this is an insight Mark gives us. Do you remember when you were a kid, if you had this moment, uh, can you remember the moment that your parents left you at home for the first time by yourself? Where they simply said, hey, we're going to run to the grocery store and you'd pitched a fit and didn't want to go. And they said, okay, we're going to leave you here. Don't open the door for anybody. Don't let anybody in. Just behave. And the minute they left, do you remember that feeling? That awesome feeling? I can eat all the Oreos. I can drink milk right out of the jug. I can do whatever I want. 
I can leave the lid down if I want or up. It doesn't, I can do anything I want. I'm king of the domain. And then they returned and power was gone. This is what the disciples were facing for the first time. Jesus is up on the Mount of Transfiguration and then opportunity comes for them to do ministry and he's not there. Jesus wanted them to know he wasn't going to be there very much longer. This plays a big role in the part of the story we're going to see today. How would they act when he wasn't there? Because they better get used to it because he was going back to be with the Father and his Holy Spirit would be left. But they wouldn't see the physical Jesus. He wouldn't be doing these things for them. He would be doing these things through them. So now we enter a time when the story turns toward Jerusalem. And out of the glory of the transfiguration, the mountaintop, I want to contrast where we've been two weeks ago and where we are today. The Mount of Transfiguration, they were on a mountaintop. There's a beautiful moment. God said, this is my son, listen to him. Elijah, Moses were there. His face was as bright as the sun. His whole glory had been revealed. His countenance had been changed. The disciples said, we need to cleanse ourselves because we're in the presence of God's purity and we're gonna die. And Jesus said, no, no, I'm your protection. From that mountaintop, Jesus is going down to the valley. Please understand that that is more than just a historical fact. It's a great metaphor. For many of us, we want to live on the mountaintop, but we can't. We're going to go through the valley where life happens. And this story today that Jesus went through reveals us what can happen. But let's look at the contrast. On the mountain, there is glory. In the valley, Jesus would discover suffering. On the mountain, God dominated the scene. Down in the valley, Satan's dominating. On the mountain, the heavenly father is pleased. In the valley, an earthly father is devastated. On the mountaintop, there's a perfect son in a damaged world. In the valley, there's a damaged son awaiting a perfect world. The contrasts are so evident. It's a beautiful scene. There's a dramatic moment going on. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. So Jesus comes down, the remaining disciples and a few others are gathered. There's a bit of a commotion. The crowd is stirred up. There's a lot of arguing going back and forth. There's shame and embarrassment on one side. There's arrogance and opportunity on the other. And this is all playing itself out. Verse 15. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. Now I want you to notice the question. He says, what are you arguing with them about? He's talking to his disciples. But the crowd sees him, and it says they're overwhelmed. Mark only uses that Greek word twice. He uses it here, and he uses it in the Garden of Gethsemane when it says Jesus was overcome with grief. When the crowd saw Jesus, because of the commotion, because of what was taking place, which we'll get to in a moment, when they see Jesus, their hopes, they're overwhelmed with joy. The, the solver is here, the one who's going to fix this, the powerful one's here. Everyone else is not powerful. Everyone else is ashamed and embarrassed because they can't do what needs done. And Jesus says, what are you arguing about? Did your parents ever catch you doing something when you were young and you didn't answer their question? Did your parents ever look at you and go, what are you doing? And you're like, oh, nothing. You just lied because if they didn't know, you weren't going to tell them. And you lock down and you put your head down. There's a bit of shame and discomfort because you're trying to figure out, what should I say, what should I not say? Jesus says to his disciples, what are you arguing with them about? And they don't answer. Verse 17 says, a man in the crowd answered. The man who brought this whole scene together, he steps in to the place of the disciples. Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. And that's the moment. You see, he brought his son who had been demon-possessed. And, and I want to pause there. In verse 18, it says, whenever it seizes him. There are some today that are so arrogant. And, and I, I use that word effectively, I believe. They're arrogant because they believe that they know more than the eyewitnesses of that day. The father said, my son has been demon-possessed. And when the demon seizes him, and Jesus did not dismiss him by going, oh, silly man believing in myths. There's no such thing as demon possession. Jesus affirmed his diagnosis. But in our world today, we are so arrogant to assume that, oh, it was just an epileptic seizure. But these people were so ignorant that they didn't understand, so they just cast it off as a demon. That's not true. If the God of the universe cast the demon out of a young man, it was a demon, not a seizure. 
It's important for us to understand that if we're going to believe what the scriptures teach, and we should, that we need to let them speak while we're silent. And Jesus, the Father said, when it seizes him, it dashes him to the ground. It's tormented him since he was a kid. Luke said the Father begged him. He said the Father fell on his knees and called him Lord. He's a desperate dad. He's hurting. Imagine yourself having a child who's thrown into these thrown on the ground and he's uh, rigid and foaming at the mouth. And if you've ever seen anyone go through a seizure, you realize what a helpless condition it is for those that aren't and the struggle with all of that. But he knew the power of Jesus. And he said, I went to your disciples, but they couldn't help me. And that's not a flawed assumption. If you look at Mark chapter six, this is why the man would have believed they could. In Mark six, it says, verse 13, they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. They had done this before. They had cast out demons, not epileptics, not grand mal seizures. They had cast out demons by the authority of Christ, verse 7. Calling the 12 to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over all evil spirits. So they had done this. So the question is, why couldn't they now? And Jesus sees the turmoil and he hears the argument and he says, what's going on here? Why are you arguing with them? Because the scribes were trying to to defame them and shame Jesus. And the man says, I brought you my son and they couldn't help him. And Jesus replies in verse 19, oh, unbelieving generation. I wonder how he said it. Tone matters, doesn't it? Did he say it with a sigh like, ah, people? Or did he look at him and go, unbelieving generation? That's the reason. You don't believe. However he said it, his point was made. And then he said, how long shall I stay with you? Now, be careful that you don't turn that in into the Western culture to go, you know what? I've had it with all of you. Be gone. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, you know I'm not here a while, right? I'm I'm going. I've told you I need to leave. And this is how you're preparing yourself? How long shall I put up with you? How much longer is this going to take? Bring the boy to me. And this is the, the powerful moment. Bring the boy to me. Allow me to be a preacher. What I mean by that is, let me give you this little pithy statement that I've come up with that helps me understand this story. Here's what I want to tell you. The father's about to get what he wants, and the demon's about to get what he doesn't. And that makes me happy. When Jesus says, bring me the kid, God's going to win, Satan's going to lose, and this is the point. This is the turn in the story Mark wants us to be at. Verse 20. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Pause there for a moment and put yourself in the story. Be the dad or be the mother of that child. You ask Jesus to help. Jesus comes. His disciples can't. Jesus comes later. He sees the child and the child is instantly, the minute Jesus sees the boy and comes near him, the child is thrown in. The demon grabs the child and begins to pummel him. Now what would you want in that moment? Verse 21. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? Who cares? If that's my kid, I'm going, can we chat later? I've got his historical records right here. Fix him. But Jesus said, how long has he been like this? And the father answered from childhood. Doesn't it remind you of when Jairus came and said, my daughter is dying, would you come heal her? And the woman touches, the other woman touches his robe and he says who touched me I felt power go out from me and the father's going wait wait she's fine she's healed my daughter and Jesus stays the father says from childhood it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him but if you do if you can do anything take pity on us and help us why would Jesus ask the question how long has he been like this it doesn't matter when you're God how long he's been like this but here's what I want you to see Jesus cares about your story Jesus just didn't want to fix the boy. Jesus wanted to build the father's faith. God's timing is never going to be ours. And if we have an issue with God not doing it as fast as we want, get over it. He's not going to change. Because he's more concerned about building your faith than fixing your condition. Because if he builds your faith, your condition becomes meaningless and useful and a moment of his glory. So you have the scene. Can you imagine how that father's every day has gone the entire lifetime of his son? Never can leave his son alone because if he 
If he's thrown down into the water, he could drown. He's been thrown into fire and burned. This isn't a precious little boy all beautific. This is a child who is scarred and damaged and hurting and every day lives in fear and torment. This is a father who has been to hell and back and Jesus cares about his story. Jesus didn't come to snap his fingers and make everything okay. He came to engage people's lives and walk with you in your story. Every one of us, our stories matter to him and that should be exceptionally exciting. When Peter Buckland, as one of our elders, stood on the stage and prayed for us, did you know what that prayer was about? It's about your condition. It's about your condition. May we expect you, Lord, to do this. May we expect you to care about our story. May we expect you to care about our business and our family and our relationships and our souls. Jesus, aren't you the one? Can we expect this from you? And the answer is yes. He cares about our story. He cares about our journey. And the father says to him, if you can do anything. And Jesus responds in verse 23, if you can. I think that's exactly how he said it too. Really? I created the earth and you wonder if I can fix this? He says, if you can, everything is possible for him who believes. And here is the linchpin to the story. It's one of the most important things Jesus will ever say. Everything is possible to him who believes. Believe in what? That's the question that needs to be answered. Because you can believe in government. You can believe in politics. You can believe in money. You can believe in power. You can believe in sex. You can believe in friendship. You can believe in everything. But not everything's possible for those who believe in something that doesn't last. Jesus said, everything is possible for those who believe. Believe in what? If he can. It comes down to our belief in him. Earlier in Mark chapter 1, and we didn't cover it in this series, there was a leper who came to Jesus, and he said, since you are able, will you? He, he said, I know you can, will you? This father says, I know you want to, but can you? It's a completely different question. You see, it's not an issue of the power of the disciples. It's an issue of the power of faith in Christ. Verse 24, immediately. Now, I pause there, and it's a terrible place to pause. Because you read the story, and Jesus says, if I can, all things are possible to those who believe. And then immediately, now, not moments later, not after a thoughtful reflection. The Greek says, spontaneously and immediately, the father says, I do believe, help me with my unbelief. And that may seem contradictory, but it's actually the reality of our lives. I do believe that he's Jesus, but there's things in my life, he's been thrown into the fire, he's been tried to be drowned, he's scarred, he's broken, I can't communicate with him, that's my son that I love, my conditions make me believe that you're able, but look at the condition I live in every day. Makes sense, doesn't it? He says, I believe in you, but it's hard to overcome my unbelief when my conditions are so tragic, so scary, so sad. When Jesus saw a crowd coming, I love this about Jesus, when he saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he's not about to put on a show for these folks. So before the crowd can gather to ooh and ah, Jesus works. He rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Deaf and mute, that's interesting. Because the father said he couldn't speak. The father never mentioned he was deaf, but Jesus, knowing what was going on, said, now the reason he can't speak is he's been made deaf. Jesus has insight into areas, and we think it's a seizure, really. Jesus knew the cause, he knew the origin, and he knew the cure. The th son is being thrashed around, and he tells him, you come out and never enter him again. Verse 26, the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. I want to pause there. My father every now and then, when my, if you don't know, and I talk about it way too much, but I come from a family of four sons and we would often get in some major fights. This is how we got along and didn't get along. Fight, wrestle, push. Somebody always got hurt and it was always me. And there'd be this major war and I had to use words because I couldn't physically dominate my brothers. So I would just keep cutting on them and cutting on them and cutting on them. And my dad often would have us stand face to face and make each other say we loved one another. I learned to act that about the age of six. I should receive an Academy Award nomination for the multiple times I told Scott, I love you, when deep down inside, the words didn't mean anything. And then oftentimes he'd make us hug or something. I remember one time he said, stand there, tell each other you love each other. Scott said, I love you. I looked at him and said, I love you. And my dad said, that's the end of this, right? And he turned around, he turned around, Scott punched me in the arm. <laughs> good, good job, Dad. 
parent of the year walking away right there. <laughs> Why do I tell you that story? Look at verse 26. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. One last shot at hurting the child. Satan promises us glory. He promises us comfort. He promises us satisfaction. And then the moment we think we're getting that from him, he leaves us desperate, empty, and broken. And he walked away and shrieked. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. I hadn't thought about this, but Tommy Nobis, who was here last hour, uh, came to me and he said, did you notice that the deaf, mute spirit heard and screamed? Jesus is good. Yeah, the deaf, mute spirit actually did the opposite of its nature because God told him to. I love that. I wish he'd have told me that two days ago. Verse 27. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Here's another one of those preacher lines that makes my tail wag. Jesus lifted up the one Satan had thrown down. That's my God. So no matter your condition right now, you may feel like you're on your face, rolling around in the dust, can hardly move. I'm here to tell you, when Jesus works, he will lift you up by the hand. And I love that Luke says, when he adds to it, he gave him back to his father. He took what Satan had stolen from the dad and he gave his son back to him, healthy and whole. Verse 28, there's a little bit of comedy here at the end. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? Which is really, Isaac pointed this out, which is really a dumb question, isn't it? The boy's healed. Does it matter why you couldn't? But fairly, they're like, we once did, now we can't. What's wrong? And Jesus replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. Before I tell you what that means, I want to tell you what it doesn't mean. First of all, don't you think for a moment this is a lesson on how to cast out demons? It is not. Your ability to cast out demons can only come from the authority of Jesus, not from you in any measure. And in a world that says, if you don't do this or this or this spiritually, then you're not really saved. I'm here to tell you, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, not by anything I'll ever do. And this is not about performing miracles, raising the dead. This is not about believing that if I just believe hard enough, I can get God's arm high enough up his back that he has to let me do what I want to do. It's not that. Then what is it? Listen to Matthew 17, 20 as Matthew extends the story with Jesus' response. Because you have so little faith, I tell you this truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. If you have what? Faith. Anything is possible to those who believe. Believe in what? I'd like to make two points, give you something to pray about, and I'll be done. First point is this. Helplessness, not holiness, is the first step to accessing the presence of God. They asked him, why? Why could we not do it? And Jesus shows them that it was the Father the father who fell on his knees and prayed a simple prayer. I do believe in you. Help me with the things I can't believe in. Help me overcome my unbelief. And that's a struggle for most of us. When we made a profession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, many of us just assume, okay, I'm good. No, you're not good. You're starting. It's the faith that saves you is the faith that propels you. The faith that guides you and leads you and creates in you new life. It's not simply a moment in time where you signed up to be saved. It's a moment in time where you begin to walk by faith and experience what that looks like and all the joys and all the challenges. Our faith will never be perfect, but it can be sufficient if it's based on Jesus Christ's power, not our own. You see, the father was helpless, but he had hope. And he fell on his face before Jesus and he called him Lord and he said, you can, I can't. The disciples couldn't because they thought they could. I know that's a strange sentence, but you know where I'm going with that? They believed that because they'd done it in the past, they could do it now. And Jesus said, no, no, this, this kind, and he used a specific Greek word, this kind of demon can only be cast out by prayer. Guess what? You didn't pray. You tried to cast the demon out by the things you always did instead of by the power available to you and me. Go on your own and you're going to end up lonely. Go with Christ and you'll end up powerful. But it all starts with the submission to the fact that I need him and without him I can do nothing. Second point I want to make is faith requires that you give God your most precious things. Nothing happened until the father gave the son to Jesus. 
His whole life was built around protecting that child. He was desperate. He'd gone to the disciples. They couldn't do it. He went to Jesus. He fell down. Jesus asked the disciples a question. The father interjected into the story. He said, help me, my son. I brought my son to you. I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you, I believe you can take this moment in time and you can transpose yourself into the story. What is the thing right now that's keeping you from believing? And I don't mean believing Jesus is God. I mean believing that he can change every moment of your existence. See, this father had to give his son. There's nothing more he could do. And he gave him. And what is that thing for you? Is it a relationship? Is it your job? Is it your health? Is it a family member who's struggling? I've had incredible conversations with people this morning all over this little end of the building I get to stay in on Sunday mornings, talking to people who are bringing me their, their son and their daughter or a coworker or a spouse who won't believe because of God's timing wasn't theirs. And they're praying for them, help them in their unbelief. It all comes down to not what we're capable of doing. But what is that thing right now? What is that condition in your life, that set of circumstances that you're begging God to fix instead of asking God to give you the faith that you need through it? And that's the application today. You're gonna have to bring God the most important things because when he takes them from you, you'll have to have faith. Look at the rich young ruler. Give all your money to the poor sell everything you have and come follow me. He couldn't because his self-sufficiency was in what he had. He says to this father, bring your boy to me. And the father handed his son over. You see, the thing that Jesus most wants from us and for us is an understanding that we bring nothing. He brings everything. And when he brings everything, our faith grows. We know where it comes from and things get taken care of. God is building our faith. He's not about fixing our condition. Because sometimes our condition is exactly where he needs us to remain so that our faith will grow. Bryce Hodgkiss, a friend of mine who preaches in Pittsburgh, Kansas, uh, wrote this yesterday in, or uh, last week in some notes we were sharing. He said, they thought that they needed the right words or the right process when what they really needed was the right connection to Jesus. Boy, Bryce is right. I love the passage in 1 Peter 1 that Peter writes. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I envy the disciples at times. I, I, I wonder strange things, and I even share them on Sundays. I wonder, could I make Jesus laugh? You know, would he give me one of those begrudging laughs my wife gives me? Or she rolls her eyes and she laughs against her will, like, ah, why did I marry you? I know I could make him angry, and I know I could disappoint him. But I wonder if he would ever look at me and go, that was a good one. I wonder if I pulled out a bag of red licorice, which I keep all over my world. And I said, Jesus, do you like red licorice? And he goes, yeah, I made it. Give me some. I wonder what he did when he had an hour between things. Did he, was he all, always serious or was he just lay back, chill, talking about life? I wonder. Peter says to us in word of encouragement, Peter said, I knew him. But he was writing a letter to people who didn't. He said, now listen, even though you never saw him, the love you have for him is real because you believe in him. And I don't want any of us to stop and go, if I'd have just heard him preach, no, look at the audience that heard him preach. Not many of them chose to believe. The fact that you and I believe is not about us. It's about what the Holy Spirit's doing in us. It's about the moment when we open the word of God and you're like, yes, that doesn't come from us. That comes from him. Our faith cannot be built on how much better we've become or how much brighter we've become or how much more scripture we know. It has nothing to do with that. Our faith can only grow when we need Jesus so desperately that nothing will happen without him. I can't do my work without him. I can't raise my kids without him. I can't be married to my wife without him. I can't be a good human being without him. There is nothing in my life that is separate from my faith that Jesus Christ has to come into the story or my story's going to end tragically. So what's the prayer we're to pray? Jesus, I believe. Help me in those areas my unbelief is choking me or blinding me or throwing me on the ground and keeping me from living the life you want me to live. You see, we sang a song a few moments ago. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Everything, three in one. 
We don't sing that song because it's just a cool song. We sing that song because it's a profession of faith. God, I believe in you. I believe in your son. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, but I need your help. I can't fix me. I need your help to guide me. Help me see what's blinding me. What conditions of my life I want you to fix before I trust you. Instead of trusting you, even though some things will remain unfixed. And we're gonna sing a couple of songs here in just a moment, not because it's time to sing. These songs say something. And if you pay attention, you're going to be moved here today because the songs we're going to sing as a profession, it's a prayer, help me with my unbelief. Some of you, your journey's hard. I've seen it with tears at the tables. You're carrying a lot of weight right now and you're not meant to. God didn't ask you to fix the world. He'll take care of that. He wants you to trust him through it step by step, faith by faith, moment by moment. If you need someone to pray with you this week, to journey with you, if you want someone that you know is going to pray with you each and every morning, each and every evening, that you that what you're facing, you can relinquish to Jesus and in his timing and in his way, fix it. We ask you, when you go out of this room, just walk out and turn to your left. In the northeast corner of our foyer, you'll see some prayer tables. I'll be there with some others. If you need someone to walk with you, I said it last hour and I need to say it and then I'll be done. It is not common in our culture for any of us to admit we've got a problem. That's uncool, it's uncalled for. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna beg you, be like the Father. Fall on your face before God Almighty and cry out, Lord, help me. He's the only thing, that the only thing that will work is our faith and his ability to do what we need done. So this morning as we sing, as we pray, as we confess, let's let Jesus know we need him. Help us in our unbelief. Let's stand together.